Chapter 5 One day the land became flat again, and on either side of the wagon, green fields dotted with cotton plants appeared up and down the rows. Lines of slaves chopped the rich, black soil with their long-handled holes. Looks like we've made it to old Mississippi, the fat man called out to the driver who jolted about on the wagon seat. Won't be long now. This was one of the few sentences the driver had spoken on the long trip. Drew Lily felt both relief and uneasiness. This must be the dreaded Deep South that Massa Henson slaves had all talked about. But it did mean that the wagon would finally stop. Might it even be that Mammy Sally was here? At all jog in the road, the wagon turned into a lane that seemed to lead straight into a field. The driver and the fat man appeared tense and nervous. They smoothed their hair and tidied their rumpled shirts and stained trousers as best as they could. When the wagon stopped bumping, as the road became, became smooth and hard, instead of brambles and shaggy bushes on either side, there were rows and rows of tall, wrinkled, barked oak trees. Julie Lee's eyes widened for hanging from the branches and floating back and forth in the summer breeze were silent cloud-like drapes of swaying green moss. It was cool and soft and beautiful, and Drew Lily wanted to catch it in her arms. But the row of trees ended in a stretch of thick green grass. Shading it from every ray of sun were three wide-spreading magnolia trees, Fresh white blossoms sprang from the heavy wax leaves. To Drew Lily, they looked like the white linen napkins from Missy Henson's big house hanging up to dry. A gentle fragrance filled the air. Then Drew Lily saw the big house. She stared. It was not at all like Massa Henson's. Clean white pillars rose in front of the largest house she has ever seen. They looked as though... They sprouted from the earth, and between them, in glistening white, were rows of steps fanned out like a peacock's plume. Two white folks sat on the green lawn in wide frame chairs. The man was tall and thin. Drew Lily especially noticed that his hair was copper red and that his sharp trimmed beard matched it exactly. His knees were crossed and his high riding boots shone like pools of muddy water. He flicked a riding whip and laughed at a row of white geese parading over the lawn. The woman was frail and sank back into her chair into the fluffy billows of a pink dress. Neither of them looked in the direction of Julie's wagon. They barely noticed the fat man who walked towards them until he said, Morning, sir. The fat man bowed slightly and waited. I see, Sims, drawled the man in the chair. You've bought us, brought us, you've bought us a sorry looking parcel of slaves. He glanced briefly at the chained Adam, then and Lester. Get them back to the nigger quarters and see that they're ready for work in the morning. Yes, sir, Sims bowed again. Good day to y'all, Miss Riley, Master Riley. The fat man backed away towards the slave wagon. So, Julie thought to herself, this is the Riley plantation, and he's the Massa, same as Massa Henson. Then, with a shock, she realized that the fat man, Sims, was the overseer. He was boss of all the slaves. The wagon pulled back to a thin road behind the big house. Weeds and tangled brambles took over between the trees. There was a wide space at the end of the road but no grass grew on it. The stomping bare feet of hundreds of black folks had packed the earth into a hard, bare floor. It must be Sunday, Julie decided, for all the slaves were at home. She wondered if Sunday here would be the same at Massa Henson's. A banjo would be scrounged up and washing, cooking, and visiting were done. And maybe at Massa Henson's a banjo would be scrounged up? and dancing and singing would start. The little children in the cart leaned eagerly over the sides, perhaps expecting to find home in their mammies. 
but Julia Lee drew back into a corner. This wasn't like Massa Hanson's slave quarters. There was no laughter and almost no talk. The old folks leaned idle against the doors of two long rows of tattered huts. The children with legs scrawny as chicken legs sat scratching the dust with sticks and feathers. They had caved in cheeks that sucked their smiles off their tiny faces. At Massa Hansen's, there had been gardens around the huts and a hen scratching here and there. But here, the huts were low and ugly. The doors sagged and broke on broken hinges, and the walls of logs spread wide where the mud chinkin had fallen out. There was fear and a set, unspoken hatred in the eyes of the slaves when fat, red-faced Sin strode near them. He stopped between the cabin rows and ran, ran the pudginess of his hand over his oily, wet hair. His jaybird voice screeched, Some of you lazy niggers take these boys to the tool house and unloose their chains. See that they're ready for work in the morning. He kicked his heavy foot in the direction of Adam, Ben, and Lester. Drew Lily's wagon stopped before a low building. It was longer than the other huts. Take these babies, Granny, he sneered at a sullen old woman, dried up like a crinkly brown leaf. She sucked at an empty pipe. A younger woman came forward and carried them one by one into the low house. They whimpered and reached out after Drew Lily, but the woman closed their mouths with her wide black hand and hurried them through the second door. Drew Lily began climbing off the rig to follow them. They were almost like her babies now. Little Lily Brown broke loose from the wrinkled old granny and grabbed Drew Lily's skirt. Drew Lily, he screamed. Sim scowled at the two of them with sudden anger. Shut that baby's mouth, granny, he shouted at the old lady. She grabbed Willie with one claw like can and shut his mouth with the other. Sin's small eyes appraised Drew Willie. She is big for her age and strong. Put her with the field niggers that ain't got families. He stretched his whip in the direction of another log, long cabin. Drew Willie walked away from the children towards an ugly long shack and went inside. There was light and air only from the open door and the cracks in the wall. The small space of hard dirt floor seemed packed with girls, each one clinging to a pile of filthy rags. Drew Lily didn't look for Mammy Sally. She didn't want to find her here. There was an empty space beside a sullen hunched back girl. Even in the dim light, Drew Lily could see ugly scars running down her legs and across her cheeks. I'm Liza, a soft voice spoke from the deep shadow against the wall. Drew Lily sat down beside her.